5 a.m. in Gaza, barely even dawn. But time already to be stirring in one unlucky house. A mother's duty to send her son to a place she dreads. Though year by year it gets no easier. Tea, she hopes, will revive him. But that's not the first fix Mohammed needs to face the day. Elsewhere in Gaza, other hands are breaking bonds. They're eager to get to work. Heading off towards the horizon. Madeline loves her job. But she too, like Mohammed, is caught in a web of restrictions she can't unravel. This is the story of two 18-year-olds forced to grow up long before their time in a tiny, teeming sliver of land from which there's almost no escape. In Gaza, blockaded by its neighbours, Israel and Egypt, for the last five years and at war again with Israel only last month, there's little room for childhood. Mohammed's resisting reality. Today, as almost every day, he faces another gruelling and dangerous 12-hour shift in the smuggling tunnels beneath the Gazan Egyptian border. This work, it's a criminal work. No one should do it. Have you ever seen anyone dig their own grave, their own grave with their own hands, while you are digging, the tunnel might collapse at any time and kill you? But he must go, whatever the risk. Mohammed's father, with a bad back, hasn't worked for years. His mother depends on her son to feed the family of eight. He's an adult now, just, but he's been working full-time in the tunnels since he was 14, and before that at many other jobs. I didn't have a childhood. When I was eight, I worked as a porter at the border, carrying luggage, even when I was very young. I worked as well as studying, but then I found there was no time to study. Madeline's had little time to study either. She's also her family's chief breadwinner and Gaza's only fisherwoman. Being a girl makes a hard job even more complicated. I'm taking my gown off out here because the harbour is full of men and boys and they follow me with their eyes. I get trouble from some fishermen. They are jealous of me because I go out to sea and come back successfully. And sometimes they don't do so well. I get problems from the police too because I'm the only girl. They say it's forbidden, you can't go. But Madeline's gone anyway, full time for the last four years, like her father and grandfather's before. She's battling waves and politics. Israel, afraid of gun running, won't let Gazans fish far out. The ceasefire after last month's conflict extended the limit, but only from three to six nautical miles. When they gave us another three miles, the catches got better, but in a week or two, the fish up to six miles will be used up too. There are a lot of fishermen, and they go fishing all the time. Most fish are beyond even the new boundary. Today, with a storm brewing, she's not testing the limit, but she might strike lucky close in shore her kid brother can scare the fish into the net. At Mohammed's house, 22 miles away in Rafa, at the far end of the strip, work can be put off no longer. Or not much longer.
He's off to be a human mole. Another day when a mother can only wait and pray. With 28% unemployment here, thousands like him have taken the road to the tunnels since the blockade began. That was five years ago when the armed Islamist movement Hamas came to power here. Now the tunnels are a huge industry, one of the main industries in Gaza. The holes that honeycomb the sand beneath the border have become a mini Klondike. The petrol that's pumped through and the smuggled goods that are trucked away are taxed by Hamas, providing much of the government's revenue. But the system depends on the cheap muscle of men like Muhammad. Not for nothing, his mates call him Sharari, the untamed bull. He's drilled and dug many passages like this through the treacherous sand and mud. Hundreds have been buried alive in recent years when they collapse. And suddenly, they're worried it's happening again now. Hear that distant thud? And look, the power's gone off further down the tunnel. The electricity went off because the roof fell in. One prop slipped and took another with it. If anyone had been underneath, it would have killed them. Now they have to switch the whole system off to try to repair it. It's almost dark too at sea, where Madeleine's made a catch. A haul that will earn her perhaps 20 shekels, three or four pounds sterling. It's nowhere near enough to cover even the cost of the fuel for today's outing. And now the storm means no more fishing for a day or two. The family sit in the dark in one of Gaza's many power cuts, mend nets, and think about mending their jerry-built house. Indirectly damaged last month by Israeli rocket attacks. Look, it's all broken. We've had to put some stuff in the roof. It's made of asbestos. The shock waves from the blasts break everything. We're very close to military targets, so there are a lot of attacks around here. Elsewhere in Gaza, whole houses were destroyed and more than 160 lives lost. Hamas says it won, mainly because a few rockets from here hit central Israel and it tells that two-thirds of Gazans who are registered refugees, fugitives from what's now Israel or their descendants, that one day they'll go home. Madeleine doesn't believe any of that. The story of our hometown ended a long time ago. It's a dream to think we'll ever return there. It's impossible. And while the conflict goes on, so do the tunnels. Building materials must be smuggled, since Israel fears Hamas might use them for military infrastructure. Weapons, of course, must be smuggled too. For the last two years, food and consumer goods have been let in legally, but they're cheaper when brought underground from Egypt. Yeah. Mohammed's taking a break after repairing the breach, alongside a boy who looks even younger than he was when he started. Then he's back to his main job as beast of burden. The work's so exhausting, most tunnel workers take the painkiller tramadol. It is death work. Exhausting. Yesterday I walked 500 meters carrying a car bonnet. I was sweating all over. There is no ventilation down there. You feel you can't breathe. You can't carry on. That's why you take tablets. But Mohammed became addicted to tramadol. It turned him into an invincible machine. Then it began to sap his strength and use up all the money he was earning. 
I stopped eating. I stopped drinking anything. All I wanted was to take tramadol and work like a donkey. But it stopped working so well. So I increased the dose. Then one day I collapsed in the tunnel. I was carrying a big sack of flour. I started having a fit. I lost consciousness. That's when I decided to quit. I didn't sleep for two months. I didn't talk to any human being. Two months. And I thought I'd never come back to myself. Fits, anger, a lot of things happened to me. I hated myself. Sometimes I wanted to strangle myself to death. But now, thank God, I'm not using it. The beach at Rafa is where Muhammad spent much of his time as he overcame his addiction and still the only place he says he can relax. The sea is my best friend. The only friend I can tell my problems to. In another life, he'd like to be an airline pilot, but he knows that'll never happen. Doesn't he feel bad that young people in other countries have a chance to study and even to play? That's what I feel, very much. Many times I have wondered why I couldn't be like them. Well-dressed, going to school, everything perfect. Why it has to be like this for me? Are they better than me? Madeline will have to marry soon. She's had lots of suitors already. But she and her father have said no to them all. I don't believe there will be anyone who will deserve Madeline and protect her. I don't think she will have a good future in this country. Our society is closed, very closed. And she's a free spirit. Her marriage may fail because here they don't respect independent women. As for Madeline herself, the sea is the only horizon that means much to her. I hope the sea will be open much more than six miles and all the other gates to Gaza will be opened and everyone will stop thinking every time they hear a plane that there is going to be a rocket attack. But she's not very hopeful. Madeline, like Mohammed, was born in 1994, the year after the Oslo peace accords between Israel and the Palestinians. But neither she nor he, unlike their parents, has ever spoken to an Israeli. And just think, she's older than the average Gazan, who's only 17. I haven't lived long enough to know what will happen in the future. All I know is that we are born into war, we live in war, and we will die in war. Muhammad's vision of peace is narrow. All it means to him is escaping this underground hell. I hope the gates will open and the tunnels will close and there will be jobs so we can leave this kind of war. Everyone will be able to do whatever they want, but as you see, nothing has changed. We haven't gained our victory yet. Gaza, as he says, is a place that can only live from day to day, with no light yet at the end of the tunnel.